So this is a, um, a presentation of basically three um, pieces of evidence, or these are um, these are three phenomena that led um, physicists in the early 1900s and even the late 1800s um, to rethink how they thought about light. Um, and so this is um, the wave particle duality associated with light um, and light is a piece of these experiments and so um, the the three phenomena are called the photoelectric effect Compton scattering and thermal radiation and I'm going to start with the um, photoelectric effect so let me write that so photoelectric Effect. Um, so let me start by p uh, showing you this is sort of two ideas here. It's the photo, so this is light, and this piece is electric, of course, and quite literally, um, the idea is, is in this phenomena which is referred to as the photoelectric effect, you can have a situation where you have a light source or some energetic light or you know energy associated with light. Anyways, light goes into um, essentially a piece of metal and what you get from that is electricity. And so um, it sort of looks like the following. So if I have a piece of metal, some conductor, and I shine light at it, so light comes in, what I get is electric current heading away from this piece of metal. Okay, so, the, uh, yeah. So, specifically though, um, this was a cathode ray heading away, and cathode rays, um, it turns out, are electrons. So this is a ray of electrons. Um, way back when people were, I think, uh, in the th like when people were thinking in, about thermal radiation, um, and even the photoelectric effect, although I'm not 100% clear, but like on the history, but the but the idea is, is this is um, early in when even the scientists knew about electrons. So the electron itself was sort of um, a new idea. And even the structure of atoms, um, it, it wasn't clear how atoms were structured. That, you know, we, we take it for granted now that an atom has a nucleus and then it's surrounded by electrons. But, but back in these days, I think people were still trying to figure out how do we really even think about atoms themselves? Like how are the particles in the atom that the atom is made out of, how are they distributed within the atom? Um, but anyway, so the photoelectric effect ends up being explained by Einstein, and it is Einstein's Nobel Prize. Um, this is the for the photoelectric effect back in 1905. Uh, Einstein develops the theory that successfully explains the photoelectric effect, but the photoelectric experimentally, the phenomenon, is mid-1800s. Um, a person that's associated with seeing the phenomenon early on is this famous person, Frank Hertz. Okay, but anyways, the photoelectric effect essentially is the phenomenon where if you send light in towards a metal, you can, in certain situations, end up with electric current. Uh, normally, like back then, in these times, types of times, you get an electric current because of uh, like a battery, like a battery voltage or some chemistry that's going to, um, you know, cause electric currents. 
um, or use electric currents to pass energy around and have chemical reactions. Um, but here we have light itself causing the electric current. So this is a, a big curiosity. So um, let me uh, show you some evidence. All right, so here is, yeah, so let's start here, and I'm going to start on a new piece of paper. So um, evidence of the uh, phenomenon. All right, so um, so you remember, or I hope you have seen this before, but an example of a capacitor device is two separate pieces of metal. So two separate conductors. And you may remember that capacitors in your early classes, you have, you know, one metal sheet and another metal sheet, and they are insulated from each other by vacuum or a dielectric material. In this case, we're going to consider two separate conductors of a capacitor um, separated by vacuum. So um, let's say insulated from each other. Uh, by a vacuum. All right, so this is truly a capacitor. Uh, but these um, pieces of metal, I'm going to give them somewhat of a funny shape. I'm going to give one piece of metal a shape like this, and the other piece of metal, I'll just shape it like a little ball. So these are the two pieces of metal, and I'm going to connect small wires to them and direct the wires down. Here are those two wires and I'll just uh, carry them down a little bit further. Okay, so this wire right here, um, I will actually, let's see, what should I do? Yeah, I'm going to pretend like uh, this is it. Um, okay, and then I'm going to connect to these two things, right? The way we know about capacitor voltages is we imagine putting a voltmeter, you know, across the device. So here's the voltmeter across the capacitor. But I'm going to sneak in another set of wires it over like this. So this is just another wire, but this wire is a switch. So switch S. So S for switch. And this V right here is for volt meter. Okay, so um, what's more is actually I'm going to try to introduce a vacuum. So these guys back in the day when they were doing these kinds of experiments, um, they knew how to blow glass. They knew how to make their own instruments. And so you could, you know, fashion these pieces of metal and then figure out a way to encase them uh, in an evacuated um, uh, transparent, let's say. So evacuated, transparent uh, glass of some sorts. I think they tended to use quartzite or something like that. Um, so, so evacuated and transparent, say, envelope. All right. So the idea is, is there is no air. Right, So there's no air molecules. If there's air in here, then that can have an effect um, sort of against the phenomenon that we want to see. And the idea is, is we can sh 
shine light. Right, shine light into this uh, transparent envelope. Okay, and then um, so let's imagine what will happen. So you imagine being able to start over by pressing the switch. So you push the switch down, and that makes it conducting from this side of the capacitor to that side of the capacitor. So if there is any net charge on either conductor, they can equilibrate across the conducting path if you start over by pushing the switch down, right? So let's imagine, like this, this might be the easiest way to start, but you don't necessarily need to start this way. But let's imagine that when you do this, you could imagine that there is a ground, right? And so I could have actually the situation of both conductors being neutral to start with. So let's let's imagine that. You, you can press the switch and now both conductors are neutral. So there is no net charge on this device, no net electric charge. Okay, so now if you let the switch up though, in the presence of light, so let me give you an example scenario. So here's the scenario. Um, let's say you choose the light uh, to be green. So you press the switch, the conductors are neutral, you turn on a green light, I know that's red, but I don't have a green ink pen, but you imagine turning on a green light. So the green light is going on into here. Um, so the light is green. The green light has a certain frequency, say F sub capital G like this, and the voltmeter goes from zero up to some value of voltage that's referred to as the ending or stopping voltage, but it turns out it is a function of the color of light that you use. So you'll go up to some stopping potential associated with green. So now let's try, so what you do is you push the switch down, the conductors go to neutral, and now we're going to change the light color to something like blue. So blue's frequency is actually bigger than green's frequency. You, remember, you, you might remember that there is an organization uh, to the colors on the rainbow. So blue is a higher frequency than green. It is a shorter wavelength than green, but wavelength and frequency are kind of inverse issues. So, so that if you turn on the light, the voltmeter, remember you push the switch and the conductors went neutral, so the voltmeter starts again from zero. So the voltmeter is going to go from zero up to another stopping voltage. And the interesting thing is, is it really does, it goes up to a value of voltage, the voltmeter, you know, the meter's little reading needle goes up and it slows down, slows down, slows down and then it kind of like settles on a maximum value and that's referred to as the stopping potential. So it goes up and its value is actually different. The stopping potential from using a blue colored light is actually a little bit bigger than the stopping potential of green light. So you push the switch again, change the color of the light Let's try light is violet, right? So the voltmeter goes from zero up to a stopping potential, which has a different value. So I'm, I'm notating, whoops, um, that it is a, it's, it appears to be a function of the frequency. And so let me just put a, a V there. V is for violet, and I'm sorry, there's a lot of V's around because this is a voltage here. 
So these are voltages. So voltage, and then I'll, I'll just spell out the word. So the stopping potential of violet light, it turns out, is even bigger. So the stopping potential of violet is bigger than the stopping potential for blue, which was bigger than green. And so this is indicating something really interesting, especially, right, you, you remember um, the frequency of blue is bigger than green. The frequency of violet is also bigger than the frequency of blue. So it looks like the stopping potential and the frequency seem to be related to each other. They're correlated. That is, as the frequency goes up, it appears that the stopping potential in this phenomenon is also climbing. And it turns out that if you graph it, if you actually get data, that is, you know the values of the frequencies and you have measured the values of the stopping potentials, what you get um, is something really interesting. The relationship appears to be linear and the slope is, it turns out, the slope of the linear relationship in this phenomenon, this is an actual experimental phenomenon, the slope turns out to be Planck's constant, which um, you may have heard of. Okay, so the slope is Planck's constant. So it turns out that that's the value um, of the slope, which is very exciting and interesting. But anyways, um, let me go back a little bit. I've got this trend, and if you graph the dependent stopping potential as a function of frequency, you get something very, very cool. So here is the frequency of green light, here's the frequency of blue light, and here's the frequency of violet light. And if you graph the stopping potential, the stopping potential of green could be here, the stopping potential of blue was bigger, and the stopping potential of violet is even bigger. And what happens with this particular data that's pretty interesting is this line, and you, you could try some ultraviolet, some, some more violet, and you can try, like, for example, yellow and orange and red. Those are the frequencies going down. But what you, what you do, or what ends up uh, being the data, is this curve. Okay. So, um, I would like to point out, actually I shouldn't have drawn the line through the frequency axis. Um, this is voltage equal to zero. So, this right here is interesting. So let me put an exclamation point because it's interesting. Um, here is, let's say, the frequency of yellow light. If you shine yellow light in here, you get a really small stopping potential, right? Small stopping potential. But if you put in red light, in this example, red causes no photo. It's called current, right? There are no electrons moving across the gap. There is no current that causes a separation of charge on the capacitor. So there is no current. So red is unable to cause a current. Um, there is a cutoff frequency. And that cutoff frequency is right here. This is the lowest frequency such that there is just a photocurrent. The stopping potential is just a value just above zero at this cutoff frequency or something like that. But anyways, there's a cutoff frequency. And it turns out that in this sort of mocked up, you know, example, which is not particularly driven by data, but the idea is is red causes no photocurrent. So, okay. So this slope
right? Now, it turns out that if you go and what you do is you, um, so let me mock up this data again just on a graph. So this graph, I'm going to um, do, do the following. So um, So let's um, model the electron current. So we're modeling the current. So um, here is our one of the capacitor plates. I won't draw out the complete drawing. And here is the other capacitor plate that I made look like a little ball. And here is one of the colors of light coming in. So as electrons are caused to move across, so we're modeling the current, we're modeling the electrons, the electrons move across, and what happens is if the electron does this path, this little ball gains negative charge, and this plate over here starts to become more and more positive, right? So as you stream in this light, and you are able to liberate electrons from cathode. So the cathode is this side. It's referred to as K for cathode. This side over here is called the anode. So the electrons go to the anode, right? So I've caused three vacancies, say over here, or three missing electrons. Well, the electrons can't stay in the vacuum what we've done is we've used energy from the light to, to sort of boost the electron um, up out of this metal and onto against the pushback by those electrons, right? It up to um, uh, this uh, conductor over here that is getting more and more negatively charged. So as this happens more and more and more, the voltage right is growing and it grows up to the max value um, V stop for and it, and I I let on that actually V stop was a function of the frequency the color of the light that you're using into your apparatus to cause the photo current but anyways so the voltage is growing up to some stopping potential and so once you're at the stopping potential, right, we are modeling the electrons of the current. We're not modeling the light right now. We're modeling the electrons. So once you um, reach up to V stop, that means that this conductor on the right side has become very negatively charged. So there, it's already really negative. So I've drawn, what, eight little minus signs. And this thing has become even more so here is, I think that's eight plus signs to, to where it's a neutral, electrically neutral apparatus, all told. So every next, so here's, we're continuing to model the current. Every next electron that boosts out because of this light actually takes a round trip. It gets pretty close and then comes back because this is now stopping all the next electrons. That's why it's referred to as the uh, stopping potential. Stops all the rest of the electrons that the light can liberate. Right? So, um, so this is modeling the current. Let's try to model um, what the light is doing. So the light brings in energy um, to liberate, or try to liberate, right, to liberate electrons. And the idea is 
what this um, bit of data is showing us. If we have the stopping, oops, I shouldn't have drawn it there. This is somewhere uh, at a voltage before the stopping potential. This is when the potential difference between these two things is the stopping potential. So the idea is, is electrons trying to cross that voltage gap, they almost, right, so the light comes in and gives the electron kinetic energy. The kinetic energy is precisely the same, or is about the same value, as the stopping potential times the charge that's involved. And the charge involved is electrons. We're liberating electrons, and electrons can't make it across that gap, or this is the gap that whatever kinetic energy that they can gather from the light just is sort of at the boundary. It's like um, this is the limit on the possible kinetic energy that you can get, so it's the maximum value of kinetic energy you can get, and um, it uh, gives rise to this, um, uh, or, or it's limited by uh, this stopping potential and um, that charge, because that's the charge trying to jump the gap, right? So this is the maximum value of the kinetic energy that this light can produce. So we're continuing to sort of, like, we have, this is in the model of our what makes up our current. It's electrons trying to jump that gap, right? and those electrons have a maximum value of kinetic energy from this light. But over here in this picture, we have um, actually the data as a function of frequency. I'm going to convert, instead of voltage versus frequency, I'm going to, I'm going to make a, a head start on some analysis and talk about the stopping potential. So this is naturally, look at electron volts as the unit, right? So this, these are electron volts. So these are going to have certain values of electron volts. This is some cutoff frequency. And um, this part of the curve is all data. This piece of the curve, you can't measure, but you can predict. This is why I was kind of um, uh, regretful that I drew that piece as if it was data. It's not data. It's only data up here, because these. this is the only um, set of frequencies. It's, it's the only piece of the frequencies that cause anything that you can measure. You're not going to measure negative voltages. The light's not going to add electrons the light's not going to add electrons here. It's not going, it, the light has nothing, it's not hitting the anode, it's only hitting the cathode part. So, um, yeah, so there's this cutoff frequency, and if you project down to the axis, there is something called phi, and actually, because this is hitting below zero down here, this right here is given um, the uh, this intercept is actually um, it has this added minus sign where phi itself so the opposite of the y-intercept here so phi itself is referred to as the work function of the metal right or of the cathode so the work function of the cathode. Um, so what the light is doing is light brings in energy to liberate electrons. And here is how um, Einstein envisioned, and maybe some other people too, but Einstein um, gave us this model. Um, Einstein said that the energy brought in by light has two jobs to do. It has to fulfill this energy payment, right? This is just getting the electron up out against the work function of the metal. It's to remove the electron. But then it's 
So what the light does is provide energy in the form of kinetic energy. So the energy by the light is kinetic energy for the light. Uh, I mean, no, no, it's kinetic energy for the electron, right, in order to cross the gap. But the other job of the light was to bring in energy for the escape. So you have to leave the metal, but then once you're outside of the metal, you actually have to fight an uphill battle to get away from the metal permanently. Otherwise, you know, you left behind this positive charge, so the electrons are still attracted back. So if it has enough kinetic energy, and maybe also there's a little bit of luck involved in being headed the right way, um, but anyhow, uh, this is the energy model. This is the energy model, right? This is just energy conservation. So the work function and the kinetic energy to cross the gap. And this, if you start to try to match the data up here, um, it looks like that the energy that the light brings in is proportional um, to the frequency, right? So this has some slope, and this is a, a linear function of the frequency. The data actually looks quite linear if you had um, colors to do the experiment with. And so Einstein says, well, the energy that the light brings in appears to look proportional to the frequency with a slope called h. So the kinetic energy idea is that there is a maximum available kinetic energy that is the measured stopping potential times the charge of the object trying to cross that potential gap. And so you, um, you write this, E V stop, and then add the phi like this. And if you subtract the phi over, it looks like this equation over here, or this, this line. This line looks like EV stop equals HF minus phi, right here. Okay, so this is Einstein's model. It depends on the frequency. So um, let's try to think about the photoelectric effect and try to model the light itself. We have a little bit of a model of the current. The current is just individual electrons. When they are ejected by the light, which we have not modeled yet, but when they're ejected by the light, they behave as individual little particles. And those individual little particles need to fight a voltage. And it looks like from all of this from the data it looks like there is a maximum value of the voltage um, there uh, associated with that maximum value of the voltage is an ultimate value of kinetic energy that the electrons can have they it turns out that it looks like for a given frequency the electrons can't have any larger than this maximum value of kinetic energy okay um, so that, yeah, so let's model the light aspect of this phenomenon. And the, um, I'll cut to the chase a little bit. People were wondering, well, isn't light an electromagnetic wave, right? It's, isn't it a wave? So some things about waves and light waves is brightness. Whoops, um, brightness is related to intensity and intensity which is I think a nice um, sort of physics measurement of brightness but intensity is called I and I is proportional to um, whoops not delta it's proportional to the amplitude of our wave squared right electromagnetic waves um, the wave aspect, right, a wave looks like this, and these are the amplitude, right, the, the height of the wave is the, is the sort of max value of electric field, and you, you take the magnitude squared, 
and the intensity is proportional to that with some other stuff like I think mu naught and maybe some other things but anyways um, this intensity is energy per area and then also per time so if we talk about the energy delivered by A light wave, this energy is going to be proportional to the amplitude of our electromagnetic wave squared, or the, it's proportional to this thing I'm, I'm describing as brightness, but it's also proportional to how much time, right, that you wait. The longer and longer that you wait in time uh, for whatever brightness of light that you have, the longer that you wait, right, is more energy on a particular area. So it looks like for electromagnetic waves, this is how we would understand or model how light waves bring energy and liberate electrons. It's, it seems to be time dependent. And it also seems to be brightness dependent. The model tells us that we should expect photo currents, right? Electrons to be liberated and move across the gap that depend on brightness and time that you wait right but it turns out um, photoelectric effect uh, the photoelectric effect depends on neither um, brightness nor time. So what we would say is this is a failure of wave model in this case. Right? Here's a, another failure. Uh, notice that the wave model um, says that energy delivered by the light is not dependent on frequency. But over here, this is the experimental data. The photo current that you get is, or that's that's ultimately stopped by your stopping potential that grows because of the photocurrent. This, this is a hundred percent dependent on the frequency. Uh, well, the and also the um, the work function of the of the cathode. But the but the idea is is this effect is frequency centered, honestly. And E and M waves, nothing about the energy, actually depends on frequency. It's another failure, right? So energy is not dependent on frequency uh, in the wave model, but the photoelectric effect is frequency centered. Right? It's it's uh, very much associated with frequency. So the conclusion is, is what if The appropriate light model is a swarm of photons. Each photon has energy, right? This is the energy of one 
photon, and it is equal to Planck's constant times the color or the frequency of the photon, right? So this is a particle model, right? These are um, one photon, and this is actually quite a deep detail or a big idea. One photon uh, liberates one electron is the idea. That is, uh, a photon doesn't share its energy over multiple electrons, or half a photon doesn't do anything. It's, it's like it's uh, one or nothing is the idea. One photon liberates one electron. This, I should probably write this really, really big, but I'll just um, put a big red star. That's the idea. This is, um, this is the particle theory of the photoelectric effect. Um, this right here is a quantized energy theory as well. So the energy of one photon, right, is H times F. And you notice that the energy of one photon is independent of brightness. Brightness in the photon model is just um, the number of photons. So a brighter beam of light means that you simply just have more photons in the column. Just means there's more photons per, um, say, volume of space or something like that. There's a larger photon flux for brighter lights or brighter beams uh, per area. Okay, so um, yeah, this is the quantum of energy delivered by light. Okay, so this is a, uh, remember we're exploring what's referred to as wave-particle duality and the photoelectric effect is a feather in the cap of a particle behavior. But that doesn't mean that we just proved that light is a particle because light absolutely still behaves like a wave in other um, phenomena. So light still uh, refracts and defracts. Light still interferes, builds interference patterns. It's very energetic. Um, but it also seems to not behave as a wave because the photoelectric effect gives us a whole bunch of evidence that um, this is not how light behaves in this particular situation, this particular phenomenon.